Hi, I'm Dr. David Palmer, and thank you for joining us as we continue our journey through the New Testament using Casket Empty. We're in the period of Pentecost as we look at the expanding witness to Jesus through the early Christian community filled with the Holy Spirit, crossing cultural barriers and proclaiming forgiveness of sins for all who believe. In this lesson, we look at the expanding witness to the ends of the earth, and we focus on Paul's second and third missionary journey and his ultimate journey to Rome itself. Remember that Jesus said that you will be clothed with power from on high, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the presence of the Holy Spirit will empower our witness to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You'll notice on the New Testament maps, this picture of the missionary journeys. And to help us understand them and keep track of them, we call them the first, second, and third missionary journey, and then Paul's final journey to Rome, narrated in the book of Acts. These are color-coded on the New Testament maps, and I encourage you to, to follow along and gain a sense of the vast scale and geography and the expansion of witness to Christ. The early Christian communities were filled with the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that fills us now. And that witness radiated out into the world that they knew, even as it must radiate out through us in our world today. The second missionary journey begins again from Antioch, where the believers were first called Christians or Christians. Paul and Silas now take the inland route, visiting the churches along the way that had been planted. And this is an important lesson for all of us in ministry, that discipleship is an ongoing process. We'll see the New Testament letters written back to these early Christian churches and communities to help them grow as followers of Jesus. Conversion to faith in Christ is just the beginning of a lifelong transformation of discipleship. They continue through what we know today as modern day Turkey, and they traverse across these cities and encourage the believers. Seeking to discern God's will, the Holy Spirit seems to block them from going to the southeast towards the city of Ephesus, to block them from going north to Bithynia, Paul finds himself on the western edge of Turkey near the ancient city of Troy, wondering what to do. And then in the moment of prayer, God gives a vision. And he sees a vision of a man in Macedonia across the Aegean Sea saying, come over here and help us. And then the narrative changes in Acts 16 that we concluded that God had called us to proclaim the gospel to them. We. All of a sudden, the narrative in the book of Acts becomes reported in the first person. Luke has joined the missionary team. They cross the Aegean Sea, crossing a significant cultural barrier and enter into Europe for the first time. It's probably the furthest away from home Paul had ever been. He crossed over into Europe and made his way to Philippi, a Roman colony, a place where the Roman Republic had died as the assassins of Julius Caesar met their fate. This city settled with Roman military veterans. They came. They searched for a synagogue, a place of prayer, but just found a few gathered alongside the river. And there we see the beginning of the church in Europe. Paul meets a woman named Lydia, who is a merchant in purple cloth from Thyatira. It's a luxury good. She's a woman of means, and yet the Lord opens her heart to believe. She's the first Christian in Europe. The gospel also reaches into the heart of a young slave girl who was used and exploited by her owners to deliver oracles. The text says that she was filled with a Pythian spirit in the original language, which is the spirit that filled the great oracle temple at Delphi and the sister sanctuary at Didyma. This young slave girl, though, was freed. Just as Jesus said he came to plunder the strong man's goods, she is freed from demonic power, set free, to worship Christ. You would think that all around her would rejoice, but her owners are upset. 
Then the gospel reaches into the heart of a Roman civil servant. Paul and the missionary team face cultural opposition. They're arrested, put in prison. And then in Acts 16, the Lord rescues them, sends an earthquake. And instead of walking out and going out to the next town, <laughs> Paul is met by the Roman jailer. He's terrified. He thinks the prisoners have escaped. Paul says, no, we're all here. He says, what must I do to be saved? What a critical question. What must I do to be saved? Everyone must ask this question. Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He, together with his household, all those in his extended family unit and his social relationships, they hear the word of Christ and, are, and believe. This is the beginning of the church in Europe at Philippi, a wealthy merchant woman, a slave girl freed from demonic oppression, and a Roman civil servant. Can you imagine them gathering together for worship next Sunday? This church, the church of the Philippians, was a lifelong partner and consistent supporter of Paul's ministry. When he writes back to them, as we'll see in the period of teaching, the letter of Philippians, it's a letter just filled with joy and love and affection. He never forgot them and they never forgot him. There is a bond that is formed among all who believe in the Lord Jesus. Well, they continue across Northern Greece and reach the Greek city of Thessalonica. It's this city that at the Northern part of Greece that Paul proclaims Christ in the synagogue. He ministers for three different weeks there. And some believe, although they encounter opposition. Paul is forced to move south and stop in the city of Veria in the north central part of Greece. The Bereans there search the scriptures to, to see if these things are true. When opposition arises again, Paul is sent by ship around the coast of Attica to come to the city of Athens. This is a city that I love. It's my wife's hometown. It's a city of learning and culture, but it's also a city when Paul visited it that was trapped in idolatry. As he waited for the missionary team to rejoin him, he moved about the city talking with people whom he met there. He met Epicureans and Stoic philosophers in the marketplace. His spirit was stirred within him with zeal for Christ at the idolatry of the city. He is brought eventually to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, to address the Athenians. He's being accused of introducing new deities to the city. Remember that that was one of the charges leveled against Socrates of corrupting the youth and introducing new deities, and it cost Socrates his life. Paul stands on Mars Hill with the Parthenon looming behind him. Jesus gives him the words. He opens this speech to the Athenians and tells them that God, the God who made all humanity, does not dwell in temples built by human hands. It's a courageous thing to say with the Parthenon right behind you, with a towering statue of the patron deity of the city, Athena, right in your back view. As Paul proclaims the identity of God, the God who created the world, who made humanity and from one man made all nations. He tells the story of God's saving work, a story that's found in Genesis, a story that's describing the God who made us and wants us to know him, a God who doesn't want us to make idols in our image because we have been made in his image. He calls the Athenians to repent and warns them that God has overlooked the season of their ignorance a remarkable thing to say in a city of learning. And he calls them not to profound philosophy. He calls them to simple trust in Jesus Christ. Some mocked him, probably unimpressed with his level of learning or his Greek diction. But others said, we'd like to hear more. And as Paul walked away from Mars Hill, he turned to see that Dionysius, a member of the ruling council, the Areopagite, he believed, together with Damaris and some others. 
When you come out of the metro station in Athens today, you walk onto the most beautiful promenade of the city and you see the street sign and the street sign says, this street is the street of Dionysius the Areopagite. It's the first Christian in that city. Paul and the missionary team continue and they cross from Attica into the Peloponnesos, the southern part of Greece. They cross through the Isthmus near Corinth and they reach this city that was again a Roman colony. It was a commercial city, a city of wealth and commerce, a city also known for immorality and vice. And he came to Corinth and on his journey to Corinth, he resolved to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He would not persuade people with rhetorical words or philosophical ideas. He would call the nations to trust Christ, his death, his resurrection. When he got to Corinth, he was overwhelmed. He said, I came to you in weakness, a city totally unreached. And yet Jesus again appeared to him in a vision and said, I have many people who belong to me in this city. Jesus sent Priscilla and Aquila, who had been kicked out of Rome by the emperor Claudius due to riots over a man named Crestus, Christ. They became lifelong friends and partners in ministry and the church grew and flourished in Corinth despite opposition and suffering. The ruler of the synagogue becomes a Christian and his replacement as well. The word of God, the gospel is attractive to all who hear it. Paul returns to Antioch at the end of the second journey and later begins the third journey. It's in the third journey that Paul travels to the city of Ephesus and he stays in Ephesus for three years. And this city becomes a hub of ministry. And sometimes we imagine Paul traveling from place to place all the time, but he stays in Corinth for a year and a half. He stays in Ephesus for three years, proclaiming Christ. When he's driven out of the synagogue, the Lord opens a, re a remarkable new venue for him in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Manuscript D of the New Testament records the hours of Paul's instruction and tells us that he taught for five hours a day for three years, thousands of hours proclaiming Christ. That's why when Paul meets with the Ephesian elders at Miletus in Acts 20, he says, I didn't hold back. I proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. Believing in Jesus is something that you can talk about for five hours a day. The whole redemptive purpose of God must be built into hearts over time. People came, as Luke says, from the entire province of Asia to hear the word of Christ. And then they went back like Epaphras to his hometown, Colossae, and told his people about what God had done in Christ. Paul, at the end of the third missionary journey, reaches the city of Corinth, and there he encourages the church there again and dreams of going to the ends of the earth. It's at this critical juncture that he writes his most important letter, the letter we know as Romans. In the second missionary journey, he had written letters back, first and second Thessalonians to the church there. In the third journey, he wrote letters from Ephesus and from Macedonia back to the church in Corinth. We know these as first and second Corinthians. But now his third letter at the end of the third missionary journey is the letter of Romans. It's a letter of introduction. It's a letter seeking missionary support to be sent to the uttermost limits of the earth. And Paul sends this letter through the hands of a woman named Phoebe, a leader in the neighboring church at Kenkuries. And then Paul heads to Jerusalem first. He heads to Jerusalem in Acts 20 with a group of men representing the fruit of his ministry. He brings an offering to Jerusalem gathered to support the church there. It's a financial gift for those in need, a gesture of solidarity, but also an embodied fulfillment of the prophetic vision of the nation streaming to Zion, bearing gifts to worship God and to honor and serve the Messianic King. In Jerusalem, he meets with the church. The gifts are received. The brothers are welcomed. The Jerusalem church asks Paul to pay a Nazarite vow for members of the community. He's willing to do it. But when he goes into the sanctuary, a riot erupts. He's accused by some not yet Christian Jews from Asia 
who knew him and said, this is the man who's teaching people everywhere not to circumcise their sons and to teach against Moses and against the sanctuary. None of those things were true. He's arrested in Jerusalem and eventually imprisoned in Caesarea. Paul's last journey, though, in Acts is his journey as a prisoner when he appeals to Caesar and travels under guard, bearing a chain. God protects his life as he stops in Crete, endures an intense shipwreck for 14 days at sea, not seeing the sun, washing ashore on the small island of Malta and eventually making his way to Italy, walking up and heading towards the city of Rome along the Appian Way Believers in Rome come out to meet him, and we discover that those who received the letter of Romans understood it and supported Paul, and they walked out to meet him. And Luke tells us in Acts that on seeing them, Paul was greatly encouraged. He arrives in Rome, and he's placed under house arrest in the poor section of town, in the insulae, tenement-style apartment complexes. And there, for two years, awaiting trial, he welcomes all who come to him. In prison there, Paul writes his last letters, which we call the prison epistles or prison letters, his final letters later again in a second imprisonment to next generation Christian leaders. But the book of Acts, the period of Pentecost ends with the word of Christ, his death and resurrection, radiating out to the world and reaching Rome. And the book of Acts ends with the word of Christ being proclaimed openly and unhindered, a word that we need today as the still unyet people groups hear the good news of him who loved us and gave himself for us, of him who died and rose again. May God bless you and use you and your community to reach the uttermost parts of the earth for the glory of God in Christ. God bless you and may his work continue in us.